It's my honor to introduce our first speaker today, Dr. Shubham Tripathi. Shubham did his bachelor's work at the Indian Institute of Technology, Kampur, before moving to Rice University for his PhD, studying with Herbert Levine, working on physical and computational mod modeling of the mechanisms underlying heterogeneity and plasticity and cell fate choice. From there, Shubham moved to Yale as a Boehringer Ingelheim Biomedical Data Science Fellow and postdoc in the lab of John Sang. Today, Shubham is gonna tell about his work on the mechanical control of transcription by DNA supercoiling. So please join me in giving a warm, albeit virtual welcome to our first speaker, Dr. Shubham Tripathi. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Hi everyone. Uh, so today I will be talk. Uh, I will be talking about work uh, that I started during uh, towards the end of my PhD and that I am uh, currently continuing, which is focused on a different kind of mechanism that can control uh, tra uh, transcription, which is based on the mechanical properties of the genome. Uh, so we are all uh, we are all uh, very uh, we are all very f uh, f familiar with the different steps that are involved in transcription. So we have the initiation step wherein the RNA polymerase is recruited to the transcription start site. We have the elongation step uh, wherein the RNA polymerase moves through the gene body, transcribing the gene. And finally, we have termination wherein the RNA polymerase, once it has finished transcribing, it falls off the genome. Uh, there, for a long time, there has been a lot of interest in whether there is a correlation between the rate of the first step and the rate of the second step. That is, does the rate of RNA movement on the genome actually depend on the rate at which the RNA polymerase is recruited to the transcription start site? And the reason this has been an interesting uh, problem is because uh, when people looked at the transcription elongation by single uh, RNA polymerases in vitro, it, uh, they saw that transcription by a single, uh, by a single uh, RNA polymerase is very bumpy, and the RNA polymerase moves with multiple pauses and arrests. However, when you look at transcription in vivo in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes, we see that RNA polymerases actually move at a pretty fast rate without, uh, without uh, a lot of bumps. Uh, so one hypothesis that was proposed to explain this is based on physical push between RNA polymerases. So the idea is that when you have a single RNA polymerase uh, transcribing, it's very, uh, it moves with a lot of pauses. But when you have multiple RNA polymerases transcribing at the same time, then the polymerase in the back can kind of physically push the polymerase in the front so that all the polymerases actually move at a fast rate. Now, for this hypothesis, which was proposed in the early 2000s, for this to be true, uh, it would uh, we would need, need to have close physical proximity between co-transcribing RNA polymerases. And this was, in fact, seen in very early studies where people looked at transcription of highly transcribed genes in bacteria. However, a more uh, a very uh, however, with more recent studies that are carried out with higher resolution, we actually see that even in the case of strongly induced genes, uh, the, uh, the RNA polymerases are not in close physical proximity, which kind of rules out this physical push kind of mechanism. So the question then is that uh, how, what, uh, what other mechanism can be responsible for cooperation between RNA polymerases, which causes uh, uh, which causes transcription in vivo to, to, uh, to proceed at a fast rate without a lot of bumps. And even uh, we can even go a step back and ask if, if, if there is in fact uh, some sort of cooperation. Uh, so uh, to understand this, uh, we looked at uh, a key property of transcription, which actually comes from the fact that the genomic DNA is double-stranded with the two strands helically wrapped around one another and the RNA polymerase moves along one of the strands. Now, because of the helical uh, uh, structure of the DNA, uh, the, RNA uh, the movement of RNA polymerase is not very different from a kind of going on a helical roller coaster. So you can see here that as the cars move up and down this roller coaster because of the helical form, the, um, the cars have to rotate around the helical axis of the roller coaster. 
and the same is true for the case of our of for, for the case of RNA polymerase. Uh, so the RNA polymerase must either uh, move, uh, must either rotate along the around the helical axis of the DNA, or it would end up twisting the DNA more and more. Now, for the case of a roller coaster, uh, the only option is for the cars to rotate because the roller coaster rails cannot be twisted. But in the case of transcription, since DNA is actually a semi-flexible polymer, uh, it can be twisted. And the RNA polymerase thus can either rotate around the helical axis or it can twist the genomic DNA in order to keep moving forward. So the movement of RNA polymerase is actually dictated by the balance between whether it can twist the DNA or whether it can rotate around the helical axis. So we will first focus on twisting of the DNA. Uh, so uh, what I mean by twisting of the DNA is that, so in the case of relaxed DNA, we have 10.4 base pairs per helical turn. If you twist the DNA in one direction, which we call positive twist, then the DNA becomes overwound when uh, wherein the two strands are more tightly wound around one another and you have uh, less than 10.4 base pairs per turn. On the other hand, if you, if you twist the DNA like in the opposite direction, then we call that as negative. And in that case, the DNA is underwound. So you, uh, it's like the two strands are only very loosely wrapped around one another. And we have more than 10.4 base pairs per turn. And, the, and whenever the DNA is either overwound or it is underwound, that's called supercoiled DNA. So that's uh, what I would mean whenever I say like supercoiling throughout this talk. Uh, so when an RNA polymerase is moving, it can twist the uh, it can twist the it can twist the DNA, and the DNA downstream from the RNA polymerase is going to be positively twisted. So you have positive supercoiling here, and the DNA that is behind or upstream from the RNA polymerase would be twisted in the opposite direction. So we will have the negative super, uh, supercoiling here. Uh, so. Uh, so if you just think of like twisting a rope, you would uh, imagine that as you twist the rope more and more, it becomes harder and harder uh, for you to twist. And the same thing happens when uh, the RNA polymerase tries to twist the DNA. So when the DNA is twisted, it applies a restoring torque. And uh, uh, just like you would expect for any other uh, string, and the restoring torque that is applied by the DNA increases as you twist the DNA more and more. And this uh, twist response uh, and how much torque is actually, uh, how much of a restoring torque the DNA can apply has been studied in great detail, both using experiments and polymer physics. And it is well known uh, how the restoring torque is going to vary. But the overall idea, irrespective of the detailed functional form, is that the restoring torque uh, applied is going to increase as you twist the DNA more and more. So as you twist it more, it becomes harder to twist. Uh, the other factor which I mentioned is the ability of the RNA polymerase to rotate around the helical axis of the DNA. Uh, so note that it's not only the RNA polymerase that has to rotate because the RNA polymerase is attached to the nascent RNA, which is, uh, which is being transcribed. The rotation of the RNA polymerase would also mean the rotation of the, no of the nascent RNA. And not only that, uh, so for the case of prokaryotes, since translation happens at the same time, so you would have ribosomes bound to the nascent RNA and they would also have to rotate. In the case of eukaryotes, you don't have translation, but then you have, uh, but you have splicing and various, uh, and a lot of, uh, and uh, various other proteins that are bound to the transcription machinery. So they also have to rotate at the same time. The overall, uh, the overall uh, idea here is that as the RNA polymerase transcribes, the nascent RNA is going to grow longer and longer, and the whole complex is going to become more and more bulky. And the rotation of this bulky complex will be inhibited by the viscous drag that will act on the overall complex. So it will. Uh, so uh, I talked about earlier how it would become harder to twist as the RNA polymerase twists the DNA more and more but it will also become harder for the RNA polymerase to rotate as it keeps moving forward because the nascent RNA keeps growing in length. So uh, this intuitive idea of uh, the balance between the ability of RNA polymerase to rotate and the ability of the RNA polymerase to twist the DNA can be put into a simple mathematical form 
uh, wherein the uh, wherein uh, the motion of the RNA polymerase is dependent on a balance between its ability to twist the DNA uh, and its ability to rotate around the helical axis of the DNA. The details of this equation are not very important, but I, I but uh, I am happy to go uh, into more detail if folks are interested. So uh, based on this very simple formulation, which basically describes the intuitive picture that I just mentioned, we can look at the kinetics of how the RNA polymerase is going to move. So if we consider the case of a single RNA polymerase that is transcribing the DNA, then we would see that uh, as expected, as the RNA polymerase moves, the nascent RNA grows in length and it becomes harder and harder to rotate. So the rotation rate of the RNA polymerase is going to decrease as it moves away from the transcription start site. Uh, as uh, now, as the as the rotation rate is decreasing, so in the beginning, the the RNA polymerase is going to start twisting the DNA more, more and more because in order to move, it has to twist uh, or rotate. Uh, so it starts the it it starts to twist the DNA, but as it twists the DNA, the DNA applies a restoring torque and it becomes harder and, and harder to twist. So as the RNA polymerase is moving forward, it becomes hard to rotate, it becomes hard to twist because of which the velocity of the RNA polymerase is going to decrease as it moves away from the transcription start site, assuming that the, that the DNA is supercoiling or the DNA twist is not relaxed by some other mechanism. Now that's the case for a single RNA polymerase that's transcribing. What happens for the case of multiple RNA polymerases that are transcribing at the same time? So we see a different behavior here. So this is the case when you only have a single uh, uh, RNA polymerase transcribing and the average velocity is pretty low. But now if I have other RNA polymerases that are recruited behind my uh, RNA polymerase, then this RNA polymerase actually speeds up uh, and its velocity almost increases by two to three fold. Now this effect is very intuitive because we you can imagine that so this RNA polymerase for example is causing the negative twist in this part of the DNA and positive twist here and and this RNA polymerase is causing positive twist here and negative behind it so the positive and the negative that is uh, the positive twist and the negative twist that is caused by adjacent RNA polymerase is going to cancel out which is going to uh, which is going to make it easier uh, for the RNA polymerases to keep moving forward because the uh, because the twist that is being generated by addition RNA polymerase is being cancelled out. Uh, and just to show that this effect of uh, speed up of uh, 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 of core transcribing RNA polymerases is is actually based on supercoiling. So we can uh, we can see that uh, we can see that uh, the uh, that the uh, that the effect goes away when you take the supercoiling out of the picture, and this prediction from our model is consistent with the data seen in in experimental studies. So in this study, they were looking at the rate of RNA polymerase movement in the case of bacteria. And they found that when you have multiple RNA polymerases transcribing at the same time, the RNA polymerases move at a faster rate. And this effect of difference between uh, the two scenarios, one RNA polymerase and multiple RNA polymerase, it disappears when you have overexpression of topoisomerase, which is an enzyme that relaxes supercoiling and uh, and gets rid of and gets rid of the supercoiling dependent effect. So with this picture, now we can look at uh, the how does the transcription elongation rate, that is the RNA polymerase velocity, how is it is going to depend on the rate of transcription initiation, which is the rate at which the RNA polymerases are being recruited. So we uh, so we would predict that when the RNA polymer when the RNA uh, when the transcription initiation rate is very low, you would have on average just one RNA polymerase transcribing at a time, and because of which it will move really slowly. So the velocity will be low, and the RNA polymerase moves in like uh, with a lot of bumps. So here is shown the velocity track of a single RNA polymerase. You see a lot of bumps, which is consistent with what is seen in earlier studies. However, as you increase the transcription initiation rate, because now you have multiple RNA polymerases that are transcribing at the same time, the, the supercoiling begins to get canceled out and all the RNA polymerases actually speed up. So the average velocity goes up. And you can see the track for a single RNA polymerase that it's pretty smooth. It's not as bumpy as you see here. 
And then finally, if you actually have too high of a transcription initiation rate, uh, then you actually have the entire gene body covered with RNA polymerase and you have a traffic jam kind of situation where your velocity again kind of, uh, your velocity again has to decrease. So, uh, so till now I have uh, described a picture that is for the, for the prokaryotic case where I haven't talked about nucleosomes at all. I've just talked about DNA. Uh, so what happens in the case of eukaryotes is that we have nucleosomes now. So that raises two questions. One is uh, what, uh, so that raises the question of what kind of effect the nucleosomes can have on the RNA polymerase. So one very simple effect is the steric hindrance uh, wherein the nucleosomes have to get out of the way for the RNA polymerase uh, to keep moving. And the other one is, uh, and the other one is uh, uh, the question of, of whether it is harder or easier to twist chromatin as compared to twisting of naked DNA. So uh, to understand this question, uh, we have to look at the fact that in the case of chromatin, the DNA is wrapped around the nucleosomes in a negative fashion. Uh, so that's the baseline state. And because the DNA is wrapped around in a negative fashion, when you twist the chromatin in a positive direction, some of the twists that you are injecting can be absorbed by the nucleosomes, and that makes it easier to twist chromatin as compared to naked DNA. And this has been shown in various experimental studies previously, and there have been some theoretical uh, uh, studies to model this. So we can. Uh, uh, so this is an example of. Uh, of what you see. So if you now, if you look at the torque as a function of uh, the uh, of the twist that is being injected, then the torque is higher for the case of naked DNA and it's lower for the case of uh, where nucleosomes are present. So we came up with a mathematical approach to, uh, to actually calculate the restoring torque as a function of the number of nucleosomes that are present and the amount of twist that we are, uh, that, that we are injecting and we can take this mathematical formulation and plug it back into the equation we had earlier. So what we get is the following that now, if you look at transcription in, in the presence of nucleosomes, then uh, comparing with the prokaryotic case, we once again get the same non-monotonic behavior that the velocity is lower at, uh, uh, at low uh, transcription initiation rate. But now you see that overall in the case of eukaryotes, the transcription elongation rate is higher and that is because the presence of nucleosomes makes it easier to twist the DNA. However, if you have a lot of nucleosomes present and they are consistently there, then they would uh, provide a lot of static hindrance and that would lower the velocity a bit. But you again see that, uh, that the velocity at least at low k on is higher in the case of eukaryotes. And, and even at higher k on, you still see that the velocities are very, are very comparable. So uh, the, oh, the Overall point here is that both in the case of eukaryotes and pro and prokaryotes, you have a you have a, the chromatin supercoiling driving cooperation, which speeds up transcription. And it's not only that uh, transcription. Uh, it, so it's not only that the uh, the the dynamics of supercoiling can also change the bursting kinetics. So for example, if you increase topoisomerase activity, our model would predict that this with low so rate of supercoiling relaxation, you would have a decrease in burst frequency. And if you overexpress topoisomerase, then you have increase in burst frequency. So our model would predict that the topoisomerase activity can actually change the statistics of RNA count in the cells. And it can change the gene, uh, and it can change the gene expression noise. One other effect is the coupling between neighboring genes. So, if you have genes in different orientations, so for example, if the genes are in tandem, then they are injecting opposite kind of supercoiling in the intermediate region. So that would cancel out. Means that these genes would actually activate one another. However, if you have like divergent genes or convergent genes, then they are injecting the same kind of supercoiling, which adds up and overall slows down transcription, meaning that they would inhibit one another. So uh, based on our uh, mathematical model, we are actually able to predict the supercoiling over large regions of the genome as a function of the transcriptional state. So I have shown here one example for a segment in yeast where we can predict the supercoiling for the control case, which is shown in red. And we can also see how the supercoiling is going to change when, uh, when the gene expression is being perturbed, for example, via the overexpression of a particular gene. 
So uh, our our approach uh, is a very powerful one for understanding how the supercoiling profile is dependent on the transcriptional state and how it is responds to various perturbations. And finally, this actually has a lot of much wider implications because supercoiling has been implicated uh, for in um, in the in uh, in determining the 3D chromatin architecture, it is a very important consideration when you want to design synthetic gene circuits because you have to understand how the context is going to affect the transcription behavior. And finally, a very recent study has shown that it has also ha has implications for target finding by uh, by Cas9. So, uh, and this is just one example of the various processes where supercoiling is uh, is involved. So. Overall, the idea here is that uh, we have a very good description now of, uh, uh, of the interplay between transcription and the supercoiling, which captures the key features of how transcription depends on supercoiling, and at the same time allows us to predict the supercoiling dynamics as a function of the of the of the transcriptional state. And we are and we are hoping to, uh, to apply this approach to various to, uh, to various different to various different contexts and try to see what kind of behaviors we can explain using this approach. Uh, so with that, I would like to thank all my co-authors on, on this study, especially uh, so especially uh, um, Herbie and Jose, uh, 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 as well as Sumitab, as well as all the funding sources. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shivan. That was great. Um, I'll remind people if you have any questions, you can type in the Q&A or click the raise hand button, um, but I'll start off. So I was wondering with your model of like initiation versus elongation rates and prokaryotes and eukaryotes, how, what are the implications for uh, in metazoans where PAL2 will pause early in elongation before being released in productive elongation? What are like the, what are the implications for pausing regulation um, with respect to downstream elongation rates? So, uh, yeah, so uh, there is at least one study that has actually implicated supercoiling in the pausing that you see uh, close to the transcription start site. So uh, the idea there is that when, as the RNA polymerase starts moving, it automate, it, uh, it, it immediately injects some supercoiling and it has to wait for the supercoiling to relax. Uh, before it uh, it starts moving again, so that study implicated supercoiling directly in the pause of the RNA polymerase close to the transcription start site. Uh, now that's just one study, uh, but if we consider that the pause is something that is intrinsic to the uh, to the RNA polymerase, then uh, the idea would be that the pause it uh, that. Uh, that the effect of supercoiling doesn't really uh, start till the RNA polymerase has moved into the gene body and the transcription has actually started because the pause is very close to the transcription st uh, start site. So uh, it wouldn't. So you wouldn't expect a, a significantly strong. Uh, uh, you wouldn't expect a significantly strong supercoiling dependence in that context. Great, um, and I think Irene has a question, so I'll let her ask it herself. This was very cool, an area I don't know a lot about, so thank you. Um, something I know I, I've heard a number of talks um, about how there are actually different types of nucleosomes playing somewhat different roles in transcriptional regulation. Right. And I was wondering if you've incorporated actually the type of nucleosome into your model and whether you think that different types of nucleosomes would actually have a different effect, different effects on the elongation rate. Yeah, so actually that's a very great, uh, that's a great question. So uh, a key factor in our model, which I didn't talk about in great, in great, uh, in great detail is the rate of binding and binding of nucleosomes or how, or how, uh, how easy uh, it is for certain nucleosomes to get out of the way of, of the RNA polymerase. And that depends on various different factors. So for example, it depends on the kind of histone modifications that are present on the nucleosomes. And it can also depend on the on the histone variants that are present inside the nucleosomes. So uh, we are looking to incorporate, for example, so it is known that if you have histone acetylation, then it is easier for nucleosomes to get out of the way, and uh, uh, and we can uh, we can incorporate that into our model, and we can try and and we can predict how the transcription kinetics are actually going to change for the case of different uh, for the case of uh, different kinds of nucleosomes that are present. So uh, the overall uh, uh, hi uh, hypothesis is that if the nucleosomes are really good at getting out of the way, so that would increase your transcriptional rate. 
and would increase uh, and would change your transcription kinetics if the nucleosomes are kind of uh, uh, like stubborn and they are and they and they don't really get out of the way fast then you would have like a lot of bumpy transcription and you would see a lot of noise in the transcription kinetics thank you that is very very thank you great um one other question building off of that have you thought about factors like the histone chaperone fact or others that can facilitate pol2 passage uh, past the nucleosome without displacing it yeah so uh uh so uh like the 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 green plot that you see here uh so that that is for the scenario for the extreme scenario of what you mentioned uh is when the nucleosomes when the rna polymerase can move through the nucleosome without uh, the need for the uh, nucleosome to get out which is the case uh, which which can happen uh, when you have certain kind of chaperones present, but also uh, there are studies showing that the nucleosome doesn't have to completely unbind uh, mm -hmm. for the you know, for the RNA polymerase to uh, to to move uh, to move through. So uh, this uh, uh, green cur curve here uh, would capture that uh, that scenario. Is that in that scenario you would see the strongest effect of the mm -hmm. twist buffering by the nucleosomes uh, because the static effect is not there at all. Uh, that being said, uh, uh, there are some studies showing that uh, the recruitment rate of these factors can itself actually depend on the supercoiling density or the amount of twist that is present on the DNA. So that would introduce more complexity, uh, but we haven't looked at that yet. Great. And then there's a question in the chat asking uh, basically how far can Paul, like how far ahead of Paul 2 can this positive supercoiling extend? Uh, so uh, it actually depends on uh, it actually would depend on if there is any barrier to supercoiling diffusion present. So uh, in experimental studies, uh, people have looked at a distance of 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 up to ten kb, uh, and uh, and you see a supercoiling dependent effect as far as ten kb uh, as far as a distance of ten kb from the from the uh, from the RNA polymerase. Uh, however, uh, so if you have a bulky protein that is bound uh, uh, to the DNA, so for example, in the case of bacteria, it is known that certain uh, uh, proteins that bind uh, that bind the, the bacterial genome, they can act as barriers. So the supercoiling accumulates uh, within the region bound by the bound by the proteins and 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 doesn't go out. So, in the absence of any uh, 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 bulky barriers, the the effect can extend over tens of kbs. Uh, but if you have barriers present, then that would uh, that would influence basically how far the supercoiling can travel. Awesome, fantastic. Okay, I think that's all the time we have for questions. So, thank you again, Sharon, for the great talk, and we'll move on thank to our next speaker everyone. now.